Now to yet another Supreme Court hearing in April that could slow down Donald Trump's January 6th trial in D.C. Nine days before the immunity hearing, justices will hear arguments related to Trump's charges of conspiracy to obstruct an official proceeding and obstruction of an attempt to obstruct an official proceeding on January 6th. My next guest, a former Trump administration lawyer, has joined a group of former prosecutors and constitutional lawyers filing an amicus brief to argue against Trump's interest in that hearing. And Ty Cobb joins me right now. He is former Trump White House counsel and former assistant U.S. attorney for the District of Maryland. Ty, welcome to the broadcast. It's good to talk with you. Uh, let me get to some details here, sir, because Trump is not named in this case that's set for April 16th. But why do you feel compelled to join this brief? And what is the point that you want to drive home to the Supreme Court? So oh, nice to be with you, Alex. Uh, the point of this brief and, and the uh, importance of this case is to uh, help shape the um, law as it pertains to obstruction of official proceedings. In the case below, the petitioner, under unusual circumstances, uh, has challenged uh, his conviction uh, and the charges with regard to um, uh, the extent of, uh, of that law, uh, trying to limit it to only uh, impairing evidence. Um, and uh, it's clear that back in the day when they drafted this statute, Congress intended Section 1512 to basically be an omnibus uh, law um, prohibiting obstruction of any kind from murdering a witness to uh, shredding documents <laughs> that would uh, impair uh, or obstruct a, uh, an official proceeding. Uh, the, the purpose of the brief here is to make sure that uh, that the court uh, gives the full force and effect of um, of that statute uh, to the conduct underlying much of the January 6th uh, activity, which did obstruct the official proceeding of the uh, uh, congressional proceeding that was underway with regard to the ballots. Mm -hmm. Certificating the uh, certification of the election. Okay. Uh, thank you for that explain, explanation sure. there. So, Ty, you worked with the Trump uh, White House for almost a year. Uh, you yes. were there for almost a year, rather, when you were brought in to manage the matters related to the Mueller investigation. And you've said that you were directly in touch with Trump on a daily basis. Can you give me a sense of what you think his mindset is as he is trying to navigate his current legal challenges? Uh, I can try. Uh, you know, he, he sort of, he has so many that he's probably not able to give any particular one, um, you know, the degree of, of concentration that he would like. Um, he has to rely on so many different lawyers and so many different teams of lawyers some of whom are uh, quite capable, others of whom have not distinguished themselves. I think it's very difficult for him, and, I, and, and he's not really a strategist in that regard. So I think he's really very much dependent uh, on the lawyers, and uh, I think that uh, has turned out to be a problem for two reasons. One, the facts are terrible. I mean, his conduct is, is reprehensible, and he's, he's subject to 91 felony counts, uh, four separate indictments, and multiple civil cases. He's lost uh, almost half a billion dollars. Um, so it's not it's not like this is a smooth gliding uh, ship. Hmm. I'm curious what it was like to serve in the Oval Office under Trump. And what can you tell us about his demeanor in your interactions with him? How did he treat you? How did he treat others? So I don't go a lot into the you know back and forth between uh, me and the former president, just because uh, I'm always nervous. Uh, and not uh, not a fan of lawyers who you know tell all, but mm -hmm. I will say that you know for for the most part in my experience, you know the the, the um, interaction was largely professional, largely you know what you would expect. Uh, there were some difficult moments. There were some uh, other moments that were um, you know highly substantive. There were some um, there was some give and take, um, and it wasn't it wasn't always. Uh, easy for either of us but uh, but I think we got through it uh, professionally and I think uh, the work on the on the um, you know so-called Russian investigation uh, went uh, relatively smoothly at least mm. in terms of the interaction between uh, the White House and the and the Mueller team uh, but um, you know I mean he this, this is a much different battlefield that he's facing now I mean these are things that he did he's been charged with 
Um, you know, a, a grand jury has charged charged him in each of the four instances. Um, you know, uh, there are multiple prosecutors all over the country engaged in, in these events, and uh, uh, it's it's quite a difficult legal minefield to to run the table mm -hmm. on. Now he does mm -hmm. have the benefit of time, at least as to the federal cases. Uh, because he'll be able to dismiss those if they're still on appeal or still active once um, once the election is over, if he wins, but only if he wins. If he loses, he's going to jail. Well, let's look at what he uh, is likely to win, which is the Republican nomination. And if you look at the yeah. headlines in recent months about a possible Trump second term, they include reports of plans for revenge, trade wars, abortion crackdowns. Many warnings are coming from people who served in his administration. And you know the man. What does the idea of a Trump return to the White House conjure up for you? Will he take vengeance if he's reelected? I I don't think so in the way that it's being portrayed necessarily. I, I'm certainly not worried. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, is he vengeful? Sure. I mean, has he proved that? I mean, ask Ronald McDaniel. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, it's amazing. Even his supporters get canned. Uh, so... Um, I, you know, he, he has the ability to be petty, as I think circumstances have demonstrated. Uh, but is he going to do that on a large scale? I don't think so. I think he'll be much more interested in the levers of power and uh, uh, the things that he can do to, uh, to uh, polish his uh, perceived greatness in his own mind. Hmm. One of the immediate hurdles he faces is coughing up cash for a bond in the $454 million judgment against him in the New York civil trial. Let's take a listen to his lawyer, Alina Haba. Here it is. We appeared before the appellate division uh, just last week. Mm -hmm. He obviously amended the order in terms of allowing the Trump children and uh, Trump family to continue mm -hmm. to operate their business and to get loans, which was a big step in the right direction. As I've always said, Martha, this is going to be a long game. What is your assessment, Ty, of how Haba has handled this case and the vulnerabilities that come with this financial pickle that Trump has found himself in? Well, I think that the that her lawyering skills, um, you know, have been have been probably appropriately assessed by most commentators. She had great difficulty uh, um, in the uh, Eugene Carroll case, you know, getting you know getting simple documents um, into evidence, getting questions asked and answered, um, notwithstanding the. Uh, efforts to assist her by the by the judge um, in the in the 400 you know, plus million dollar uh, case uh, uh, overseen by Judge Ingeron. Uh she you know she was quite disrespectful. Uh, one of her clients, she represented both Weisenberg and uh, uh, Trump, and you know Weisenberg uh, was uh, pled guilty to perjury in that case um, uh, subsequently. So I think. I think you see some pretty extreme danger down the road for her, I think, um, uh, in terms of the ability to uh, the ability to uh, uh, continue on the federal court stage or the or the high profile stage. But at the same time, I think it's also uh, important to understand that, you know, I don't think the president expected to win either of those cases. And uh, while he was critical of um, uh, Mr. Takapina, in the case that he only lost $5 million in, you know, uh, uh, Lena Hobbit lost him uh, $80, $87 million. So hmm. I think I think that's a pretty good measure, measuring stick. Um, and I think she just has to, you know, she has to learn some simple foundational uh, evidentiary stuff and courtroom procedure. And most importantly, she has to learn how to respect the judges, uh, because that was sorely, la sorely lacking uh, in both cases. Yeah, I think that has been stated many a time. Ty Cobb, it's very good to speak with you. I'll look forward to doing so again. Thank you so much. Thank you, Alex.